Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Games for Girls podcast. Thank you for watching or listening. Uh, make sure you check us out at outkick.com. Anywhere where you get your podcasts, you can like and subscribe and follow along so you never miss an episode. Uh, super excited because today we are talking to my state's senator, one of the two. We are talking to Senator Marsha Blackburn. Uh, she has been someone who has been a champion, a champion for female athletes uh, in her support of the Protection of Women and Girls and Sports Act, her uh, how really she has has been able to highlight and share the importance of Title IX, what it has meant to women, uh, what the Biden-Harris administration has done to Title IX. Uh, but super excited to talk to her today because she recently uh, attempted to introduce the American Girls in Sports Day resolution, which would just celebrate the accomplishments of real women in the athletic space. Uh, but to to really no one's surprise, at least no one's surprise who has been paying attention, it was blocked. Uh, she has been steadfast in her uh, criticism, again, of, the, of, of our government, of the Biden-Harris administration, uh, but she's been critical of the NCAA, so we will talk about her uh, recent actions with the NCAA, where that stands. We're going to get into the border, uh, how children at the border who have come across the southern border are missing in this country, uh, 320,000. That's that's the most recent number that's been reported. 320,000 children are missing. Uh, we will talk about all of these things in our episode here. So be sure to stay and listen to this episode with Senator Marsha Blackburn. Well, Senator Blackburn, thank you so much for joining the Gains for Girls podcast. Uh, I see all the green and the trees behind you, which tells me you are not in D.C. You are in the beautiful state, my home state, your home state of Tennessee. Uh, so I am just I'm sure you are super thrilled about that. Uh, you don't get to spend much time at home. And so I hope you enjoy uh, the time in Tennessee. But very glad you're on. Um, I wanted to talk with you, though, because recently you introduced the American Girls in Sports Day resolution, which would merely celebrate the accomplishments of real women in the athletic space. Uh, this might come as a shock to some, but it's unsurprising to anyone who has been paying attention uh, the past few years. Uh, it was blocked. Um, I saw this and and I was... I mean, more than frustrated, I felt disheartened because we as women, the message that was sent, the message I received is that we don't get a day. The LGBTQ community, they can have months and days on end, even this past Easter Sunday, which the Biden-Harris administration declared as, as Trans Visibility Day. But women don't even, we don't even get a day. You're right about that. And Riley, I'm so delighted to join you and thrilled to know that you are doing the Games for Girls podcast. And I think that young women need to hear from you because they're inspired and encouraged by listening to your message. And you're right. Those on the left right now seem to think that we don't need to celebrate our female athletes. And, of course, we were looking at doing a resolution to honor our female athletes and celebrate Title Nine And in 2022, when Title IX turned 50 years old, I had done the resolution that honored Title IX. And then, of course, we know subsequently the Biden administration tried to weaken it. And I want everyone to know you're the one that had the idea of doing it on October 10th, which gives us the Roman numerals XX. So it becomes... October 10th for our American girls. That's XX for XX. And we think that that is vitally important. Set this day aside. Celebrate these female accomplishments. And here's why. When Title IX went on the books in 1972, and these doors of opportunity were open to women, at that point, we had fewer than 300,000 female athletes, high school, college athletes. Today, we have over 3 million. And of course, as people have paid more attention this summer because of the Olympics, and they've watched the trials, they have watched the different competitions, they have cheered for their 
their favorite athletes. Uh, we've cheered for Tennesseans that were competing and for all of Team USA. And Riley, they've they have been frustrated when there would be a time when there was a male who was swimming or running or boxing or fighting or playing tennis against a biological female. That's and her. it's a male that was choosing not to compete in the male category, but was being allowed to compete in the female category. And I have heard from so many people, not only from Tennessee, but across the country, who have said, you know what, female sports need to be for females. Male sports need to be for males. But let's not have men competing in women's sports. And this is one of those issues. I think 80% of the American people agree that women's sports should be for women. And they are frustrated when they see things like happened in the U.S. Senate on the floor of the Senate last week when a senator came to the floor and blocked the resolution to recognize American girls' achievements in the sports arena. That's right. We saw um, Chris Murphy, Senator Murphy. Uh, I mean, he was tweeting, you know, I mean, I believe he actually on the Senate floor called you a small person, whatever that means. Uh, he said he was going to go um, down to object this Republican bill that marginalizes and shames gay and transgender children. First of all, this has nothing to do with sexual yeah. orientation at all. So to even include being gay, straight, that, that has nothing to do with what you were trying to do, which, again, is honor women. It has nothing to even do with trans people. Um, we saw, I guess, what are some of the, the common responses, uh, whether it was the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act or the American Girls in Sports Day Resolution? What are some of the common responses from those who, who oppose this? Because I agree with you. I, I mean... You said the number 80%. I, I would argue that it's even higher than that uh, of American people who agree that this is unfair and unsafe, uh, more importantly. And so from your colleagues across the aisle, what what are some common responses uh, from those who, who oppose these acts? They voice their objection uh, on the floor or in their remarks, but then giving any further response, they don't. And they try to couch it in fairness. But I want to tell you something. Having a biological male compete against a female, having them get the title, the trophy, the scholarship, the opportunity, the chance of listing that as a success, what that does is to deny that female that title or trophy or success or that victory and instead of sports being a way to build uh, teamwork, it becomes something that is divisive. And what we want to do is see girls have that opportunity to learn how to be a part of a team. And I think it's why uh, when you see responses like Senator Murphy's, it is hard for the American people to understand. And when they just say, well, it's about fairness. And everybody needs to compete. But if it's about fairness, then let's have a male category. Let's have a female category. Let's have a category where students that are trans can compete if you want to talk about competing fairly. And what we want to do is protect these opportunities so that women have a category where they can run, they can swim, they can play golf and tennis and baseball, softball, uh, volleyball. They can get those scholarships. They can compete and they can win. I'm thinking back to that clip. Of course, I watched a clip of, of both yourself and Senator Murphy on the Senate floor. And one thing that it just dawned on me, I remember that he said is he said, you are more likely to be killed by a falling object in this country than have your daughter compete against a boy or what he called a, tr a trans girl. Um, <laughs> I wish he could see the messages that I receive daily, every single day. They say this isn't happening. It's a solution in search of a problem. 
I'm here to tell you that that's not true. It's happening every single day, every single level of sport, every division, every single state across the country. This is happening. Uh, yes. So you steadfast, of course, in, in calling on our government to enact change, uh, really reverse course from what the Biden-Harris administration has done to Title IX. Uh, but you've been steadfast in calling on the NCAA. Uh, even recently, uh, you sent a letter, you, you headed this letter to Charlie Baker and the NCAA uh, really urging them to require that only women compete in women's sports. Uh, you had lots of endorsements on this letter. Of course, uh, Republican senators like Senator Tommy Tuberville, Coach Tommy Tuberville, he's also yeah. been someone who has continually and consistently championed uh, mm -hmm. women athletics. Again, no support or endorsements from Democrats. Shocker. Uh, but the NCAA responded, which they responded pretty swiftly, actually, to your letter. And so can you elaborate on what their response was and what your take on it is, because it seems to me uh, like the NCAA will continue to wait for other people to tell them what to do. Yes, you know, I called it a kick the can letter because they chose not to make a decision. And as you mentioned, we had several senators, I think the number was 37, that joined me on that letter encouraging them to set a policy. And the reason why we want them to set a policy, Riley, is because the NCAA is the governing body for college sports. Since they are the governing body, we think there should be a blanket policy that protects women in collegiate sports. We think that is vitally important. And the NCAA is basically saying, well, you're going to have different uh, bodies, uh, tennis, golf, swimming, all these different ones, and it's going to be different by state. So let's just let the states, let's let these different governing bodies decide how they're going to do it. And I found that really very curious because you don't see the NCAA as saying, let's let every school or let's let every conference have their own set of policies and the way they're going to conduct things. No, the NCAA has rules and regulations. And we think that preemptive policy, which would protect females and protect their opportunity in sports and let them find a way to open doors of opportunity for individuals. But Riley, for goodness sakes, Let's make certain that women have a category where they can compete and they can win. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you think of all of the, the rules the NCAA has. I mean, I think of all the rules that the NCAA put in place, even over COVID. Uh, a lot of these rules, which which to me, a swimmer who swam in the water, uh, <laughs> thought to be a bit nonsensical in terms of the mask and, and the social distancing and all the things. But nonetheless, those were those were rules that the NCAA created in a blanket style fashion. Um, so I, I agree. They responded in what I would deem a cowardly fashion and the way that they can say, sorry, our hands are tied, which is, of course, lacking in responsibility and any sort of accountability. Right. Um, but talking with you. And, you know, the thing is, let's make certain that college athletes have the opportunity to compete during their college career and that they have the ability to be a part of a team and that they have the ability to have that college scholarship and get that education. A college career is really quite short. It's you've got five years at the most. And we want all students to have the opportunity to experience what it is to be a part of a team. As we do that, there are going to be male categories. There are going to be female categories. Let's protect these opportunities for our female athletes. That's right. Uh, you've been a champion, not just for female athletes, but really for all women. Uh, earlier this year, you introduced the Women's Suffrage National Monument Location Act, uh, which would, of course, honor Women's History Month with a monument uh, on the National Mall. You've been strong in combating uh, human trafficking, which disproportionately affects women and children. Uh, you've been the lead in trying to subpoena 
Jeffrey Epstein's flight logs uh, to break apart these sex trafficking rings, which feels timely to mention given everything that that's recently surrounding P. Diddy. And so is, is there any update on that front, on the flight logs and, and the case of Jeffrey Epstein? We continue to push to get this information, and it is because we have pushed that you have seen some records released from the judges. And I, I think that as we continue our effort to expose this, as there are more of these sex traffickers, human traffickers that get pulled into court, that you're going to, there'll be, we'll be able to begin to untangle this web of individuals and see how far it's spread globally. What we do know is this, that human trafficking, sex trafficking in the U.S. alone is a $15 billion a year business. Globally, it's about $150 billion a year. And the saddest stat to me is that in this country, in this day and age, that a child is bought or sold for sex once every two minutes. Wow. And that's just a devastating statistic and heartbreaking. But it is a child once every two minutes being bought or sold. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, hearing this stat and knowing what we know about uh, the Biden-Harris administration's progressive policies uh, under the borders are, I mean, the, mm-hmm. the number that we've seen in recently this week in headlines is that 320,000 children have gone missing. And so where are these missing kids and why isn't this a headline on every single media outlet? This should be something that all of us agree on, but we know that's not the case. We saw in the and, U.S. where the violence against... Go ahead. Yeah, when it was 85,000 children about 19 months ago, that was the first time I sent a letter over to Secretary Becerra at HHS uh, because the Office of Refugee Resettlement is in Health and Human Services. And I I said, where are these children? Because we found out that the children were missing because of some New York Times reports that as they were doing stories on something else, realized that these were trafficked children that were working in these food processing plants. And so we began to do some digging on it. We had a couple of whistleblowers, and now we're finding out that the number may be as high as, you said, 320,000 children that have come across the border. And HHS, the federal government, does not know where they are. Their sponsors, who many were improperly vetted, They're not at the address that they were given. They are not answering the phone for the phone number they were given. There is no contact with them. The children have not shown up in court on their notice to appear. So we need to find out where these children are. And one of the things, Riley, that I have tried to do is we looked at this. We found out that during the Trump years, They did DNA testing at the border. It's about a 45-minute test. And that test would tell you if the child was related to the adult that was bringing them. And they would do this when there was no papers or no way to be certain that a child was related to to the adult that was bringing them. Well, it turns out about 35%, 40%, of the children that were coming with an adult that didn't have proper paperwork, they were being trafficked. So at that point, Border Patrol was able to separate the child from that adult and be able to return that child to their rightful family. Well, because the Biden administration felt like the DNA test took too long, took too much time, they eliminated that. So I have had legislation that would require that DNA test at the border to be certain that these children are not being trafficked. We also have the Save Girls Act, 
that is bipartisan, is Senator Klobuchar and I, and it is grants to local law enforcement to make certain that they can get the tools that they need to do these interdictions and to rescue these these girls. So it's a pool of money that they can go in and uh, break apart these sex trafficking rings and rescue these women and girls. And uh, there are steps like that that are common sense steps that, as you say, there should there shouldn't be disagreement on that. These things should be done immediately. That's right. Uh, well, there is no demographic more vulnerable, uh, but more important to protect and to safeguard than the demographic of children. And so we appreciate the the stand that you have taken uh, for both children and women, which is it blows my mind because the Democrats, they say they are the party for women. Um, you and I both know what they mean when they say that. So I guess to you, I mean, what issues should women care about more than the right to dismember a developing child? Yeah. And when you look at um, this issue around abortion and the only people that want to federalize abortion regulations and restrictions are the Democrats. And because of the Dobbs decision, this has been set back to the states and a vote of the people. And that is where those issues should be resolved. And every state is going to have their issues approached a little bit differently. But in a post-Dobbs era, that is where those go. We also have seen a lot of states, Riley, uh, begin to pick up their support for mothers with children, with young children, uh, more that is being done on training uh, and helping young moms learn how to be a mom and support that is coming around these families, additional support, support that would allow benefits to go to a woman when she finds out she's pregnant so that she has those extra support dollars during that time uh, that she is pregnant. Well, I appreciate you explaining that because, uh, I mean, the general public, we see the tweets that are put out by Kamala Harris on her account saying, you know, using the phrase of Trump's national abortion ban. So you explaining that debunks uh, that entirely. Right. Um I can say, yeah, there's no national, no man. And the issue has been sent back to the states. Well, um, I can tell you as a woman, I care more about walking the streets safely at night. I care more about being able to afford basic necessities. I want to support the party who can define what a woman is. I guess (laughs) they can define. And you, of course, have been pivotal in that that simple but but seemingly dreaded question of of what is a woman. And so we thank you, Senator Blackburn, again, for your stand for common sense, uh, but your stand for policies that protect the safety and the well-being of Tennesseans like myself, but much broader uh, of everyday Americans. And so thank you. We will continue to champion and support you, uh, the legislation that that you are moving through the Senate. Uh, in all the ways that we can. Absolutely. Thank you so much. What a what an honor to join you. I am so proud of you and so appreciative of the great work that you're doing. Keep it up. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in to the Gains for Girls podcast. Again, be sure to go check out Transfixed, my new docuseries on Fox Nation. You can check that out at foxnation.com. Be sure to go to outkick.com. Uh, follow and support all things Gain Some Girls. You can see the other Outkick shows that are listed there. Uh, and we hope to see you guys again next week. Hey. 
everybody. Thank you so much for watching. The fight to save women's sports and restore common sense is far from over, and I continue the conversation every week. So make sure to catch more content over here and subscribe to OutKick so you don't miss a thing.